Hello to our online audience, and thank you for joining this latest Science AAAS webinar, Deciphering CAR T Cells, Exploring Functional Mechanisms to Drive Next Generation Immunotherapy. I'm Sean Sanders, Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science, and it will be my pleasure to act as moderator for today's discussion. This is the second webinar in our 2019 Deciphering series. You can find part one by clicking the link at the end of the overview uh, just to the right of your slide viewer. Chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR T cells, are patient-derived T cells engineered to express an antigen receptor that is specific for the patient's tumor cells. T cell immunotherapy shows great promise as a treatment for cancer and other diseases, but while there have been some clinical successes, researchers still face challenges in optimizing its effectiveness, particularly when applying it to solid tumors and in addressing safety concerns such as neurotoxicities. Understanding the functional mechanisms and underlying signaling pathways of CAR T cell activity is crucial to overcoming these challenges in order to develop better clinical strategies. This webinar will introduce the audience to the range of different T cell subpopulations and the roles they play in normal immune function as well as in disease. We will also address how recent breakthroughs in our understanding of these specialized immune cells may lead to improvements in disease treatment. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our esteemed speakers to you now. They are Dr. Stanley Rydell from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and Dr. Wendell Lim from the University of California, San Francisco. Thank you both so much for making the time to be with us today. Before we get started, I have some important information for our online viewers. You'll find photographs of today's speakers in the presenters tab at the top right of your screen. You can click on the view bio link to read more details about their background and research. Also to the right, you'll see the resources tab where you can find additional information about technologies related to today's discussion as well as a PDF of the slides. Following the speaker presentations, we'll have a short Q&A session during which we will have some time to address some of the questions submitted by our live online viewers. So if you are joining us live, please start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time during the presentations by clicking the Ask a Question tab, also on the right, typing the question into the message box and clicking OK. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant icon at the bottom left under the slide viewer. For tweets, you can add the hashtag hash science webinar. Finally, thank you to Cell Signaling Technology for sponsoring today's webinar. Now on to our first speaker for today, Dr. Stanley Rydell. Dr. Rydell is currently Scientific Director of the Immunotherapy Integrated Research Center at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Washington, both in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Rydell's lab focuses on establishing the principles for the safe and effective use of T-cell immunotherapy to treat cancer. Thank you so much for being on the line today, Dr. Rydell. Uh, thank, thank you, Sean. Um, it's, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, as Sean indicated, the field of synthetic biology and T-cell engineering is uh, emerging as a real strategy to treat cancer and, and has had uh, some notable successes to date. And as I think we'll discuss today, um, uh, there are certainly challenges that we need to address. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the role of uh, signaling domains in synthetic receptors that we designed to target cancer cells and how these signaling domains uh, uh, differ in the way they instruct T cell function and fate. Um, these are my disclosures. So the design of receptors that target cancer cells is largely based on what we understand about T cell receptor signaling. So T the T cell receptor recognizes peptide MAC complexes uh, and initiates phosphoprotein signaling in the cell uh, through phosphorylation events uh, initially on the CD3 chains uh, and subsequently uh, with LCK brought in by the, the CD8 or CD4 co-receptor uh, to downstream uh, signaling molecules and adapters that uh, ultimately a lead to alterations in gene uh, transcription, uh, cell differentiation, and the acquisition of effector function. Now, co-stimulation is typically provided uh, in trans uh, through separate molecules such as CD28 and 41BB um, in, in a normal T cell receptor signaling to augment uh, receptor uh, pathways. 
So synthetic receptors are designed based on these principles. Um, and what the difference is, is that we actually incorporate a binding domain uh, that now targets a cell surface molecule that's independent of peptide MHC. Now, this has advantages in terms of uh, targeting uh, molecules on cancer cells because we're not uh, confined by MHC restriction. Uh, but it also has disadvantages in that we have to link uh, that binding domain to intracellular signaling molecules. And I've depicted the two most common common uh, car designs here on the left uh, that incorporate CD28 as a co-stimulatory molecule and CD3 zeta as the, as the CD3 chain that initiates TCR signaling, uh, and, and the one to the right of that uh, with 41BB CD3 zeta. Now, as I mentioned, these uh, instruct the T cell now to be able to recognize cell surface molecules on cancer cells uh, and to uh, mediate effector functions. Um, now, the two most common uh, CARs that have now been approved target a molecule called CD19 on B cell malignancies, uh, and they are, again, with these two common designs of CD28, CD3 zeta, and 41BB, CD3 zeta. Now, uh, with the caveat that uh, the, the approved uh, constructs that are being used in the clinic uh, are uh, in different uh, viral vectors, so the CD28 zeta, the Yaskarta uh, construct is in a retroviral vector, uh, the uh, Kimraya construct 41BB zeta is in a lentiviral vector, and of course different cell manufacturing platforms and patient heterogeneity really preclude uh, detailed analysis of how these cells behave. But I think we can make some generalizations from what's been published clinically. The, the Yaskarta product expands rapidly in patients, uh, but these cells rarely persist beyond a couple of months at significant levels. And it may be associated with earlier cytokine release syndrome than the 41BB zeta car, where the cells tend to expand more slowly and may uh, persist longer. So we were interested in trying to understand what might underlie these differences. And in particular, um, how does CAR signaling differ depending on the co-stimulatory domain? And how does CAR signaling affect T cell fate and function? And then subsequently, can information that are, that's derived from signaling studies ultimately inform new CAR designs? Uh, now, I think this really, these principles really um, can be extended to any synthetic receptor that we introduce into cells to confer a function, that we really, uh, I think, need to be thinking about how do we uh, really interrogate that receptor to understand whether it's doing what we think it, it, it's supposed to be doing. So. Uh, this is work that I'm going to describe is largely done by a graduate student in the lab. Now he's a postdoc, um, uh, Alex Salter, who, uh, when he undertook this project, started to look at how could he analyze CAR signaling in primary human T cells. We wanted to work in the cell substrate that was relevant to, uh, to the clinical uh, application of this approach. And of course, there are a number of techniques that you can use, phosphoflow cytometry, Western blot, bead blot arrays, that allow you to analyze in a biased way, um, because you have to use commercially available antibodies uh, to, to a, a relatively small number of targets. And what Alex wanted to do was get a more comprehensive analysis of this. So what he really did was uh, decide to undertake shotgun mass spectrometry, which allows us to simultaneously analyze thousands of analytes uh, with relative quantitation and in a completely unbiased way. So uh, the problem that you face when you want to do uh, mass spectrometry um, with uh, cells uh, is that if you use stimulator cells and you have to look at very early events in, in receptor signaling, you are going to contaminate your cell lysates by the proteins that come uh, from the, the target cell. Uh, so what Alex did was uh, use a, an approach that was published by a postdoc in the lab, Stephen Liu, who demonstrated that if you introduce the small uh, strep tag sequence into a chimeric receptors, that it did not affect the function of those receptors, but allows you now to stimulate the receptor uh, with a microbead that has an anti-ST2 antibody on it. So essentially, we were able to design receptors with different SCFEs, but with uh, uh, the ST2 sequences. And then the only other structural difference in the receptor was the, was the presence of either a CD28 or 41BB co-stimulatory domain in addition to CD3 zeta. Uh, so then you can stimulate these cells uh, and you can kinetically look over time uh, by making cell lysates and running them on the mass spectrometer. And I have to point out that this was done in close collaboration with our proteomics colleagues, Amanda Polovich and Richard Ivey, and uh, with bioinformatics support from Rafael Gattardo. So what we 
observed when we uh, stimulated now primary human T cells that were engineered with CD28 zeta or 41 BB zeta cars is that we did observe what you would expect, which is uh, marked changes in intracellular proteins phosphorylation um, in the TCR signaling pathway first, uh, where you can see phosphorylation of CD3 uh, zeta of, uh, of PLC gamma 1 as the signal propagates uh, throughout the cell. Unlike T-cell receptor signaling, CARs do not phosphorylate in a, in a CAR-responsive way, CD3, epsilon, delta, or gamma chains. And I think that's one difference that ultimately may uh, play into how we can design better receptors that are uh, more sensitive and, and behave more like T-cell receptors. Um, if you now look at a global analysis at 45 minutes, what was clearly evident, if we look now with very stringent criteria for determining what was a CAR-responsive phosphorylation event, we see much more rapid and a much greater number of sites that are induced by CD28, CD3 zeta signaling than we see by 41BB, CD3 zeta signaling. Uh, this is perhaps better illustrated here, where we're now looking at 1,200 sites that we uh, we consider to be uh, uh, CAR responsive. Um, and what you can see is that most of the phosphorylation events uh, lie to the right of the uh, diagonal axis. Uh, that indicates that they're being more strongly phosphorylated uh, by CD28. Uh, CD3 zeta than they are by 41BB uh, CD3 zeta. Now, there were a couple of surprising things here. First of all, there were very few sites that were differentially modulated. Those are indicated in green. Um, and the vast majority of, of sites were more intensively modulated by CD28, CD3 zeta. Now, the differentially modulated sites did not relate to canonical CD28 or 41BB signaling pathways. So this was an assumption that, of course, we've all had in the field is that if you put CD28 in, you're signaling through that pathway. But but indeed, they activated uh, signaling intermediates of, of both pathways. Um, so this was one surprising observation. Uh, but the second uh, observation really was this difference in kinetics and, and signal intensity. Uh, and this is just showing you the, the, the substantial difference that we observe when we look at the 20 most phosphorylated sites or phospho uh, sites in the, T the KEG TCR signaling pathway, where again, these are much more phosphorylated um, in CD28 uh, versus 41BB cars. So the, the question then is, what does this do? Um, so we've, we've engineered these receptors, they signal uh, different. Um, what is the consequences of this difference in signal strength? Now, it's long been known in the T-cell receptor field that signal strength promotes promotes effective differentiation. Now, of course, one of the things that we want to do with any immunotherapy is we do want to establish a persistent uh, response that can continue to eradicate tumor cells and provide immunosurveillance, and that requires the formation of memory. And if the, t signal is, the signal strength is too strong, you essentially drive these cells to a terminally differentiated uh, effector phenotype. So based on this uh, uh, concept, then, we decided to look at whether or not we actually observe this transcriptionally. And so looking now at uh, RNA-seq of CAR T cells, these are primary human T cells, signal 3, they're a CD28 or, or 41BB CAR, what you see is that the CD28 CAR uh, tends to drive more effector uh, uh, transcription. So you'll see uh, higher levels of interferon gamma, IL-2, TNF, CCL3, CCL4, granzyme. B, whereas you will see uh, lower levels of genes that are associated with uh, the acquisition of T-cell memory, things like the FOXO family, KLF2, IL-7 receptor, uh, to name a few. So this the, did suggest, indeed, that this very strong signaling that we were observed was driving a greater effector T-cell differentiation. Now, does this translate into any meaningful difference in, in efficacy? Uh, well, if you give a high CAR T-cell dose to mice that are engrafted with Raji tumors, so these are now NSG mice, and, gra and grafted with human uh, lymphoma cells and now treated with CD19 CAR T cells, either that are 41 BB or CD28 zeta, at a high CAR T cell dose, you get cure of, of the mice. So both are, are effective at high CAR T cell doses. But if you now start to lower the CAR T cell dose, essentially to put a stress on the system, what you observe is the CD28, CD3 zeta CARs are less effective in tumor uh, control. And this indeed relates to the fact that these more uh, differentiated effector cells um, will in fact acquire an exhaustion phenotype or express higher levels of inhibitory receptors uh, earlier than the ones uh, that express 41BB. So this is shown here that despite equal numbers of CAR T cells in the bone marrow and in the blood, what you observe is higher levels of PD-1, LAG3, and TIM3, suggesting uh, that these cells uh, are losing their activity in, because of expression of these inhibitory receptors. 
So sort of in a visual format, what you might imagine then is when we see uh, a stimulation of a CD28, CD3 zeta car, we get this more intense, more rapid uh, phosphorylation and signaling that drives effector uh, cell differentiation. So the next question that Alex asks is what underlies this? Why is this different? If in fact they're signaling through both pathways, um, what's uh, the, the basis of this more intense signaling? And what Alex found was that if you look in the basal state, and this is shown uh, in the panels, in the Western blot panels on the left, um, that you will see that there is basal phosphorylation of the CAR CD3 zeta chain um, uh, with the CD28 CD3 zeta CAR compared to the 41 VB CD3 zeta CAR. Now this level of tonic signaling is not sufficient to uh, observe any phenotypic differences in the cells, but may in fact uh, prime the cell to uh, more rapidly uh, phosphorylate downstream intermediates when the receptor is engaged. Alex also used the, uh, anti, the strep tag uh, sequence in the CAR to be able to pull down uh, the CAR receptor from the primary T cells and analyze um, by immunoblot whether there were other molecules that might be associated with the receptor. And indeed, there are many, and I'm just showing you a couple here that the CD28, CD3 zeta car has in the basal state uh, LCK associated with the receptor, uh, as well as endogenous CD28 um, compared to the 41BB car. So it seems like this receptor is already as assembling, essentially, a signaling complex that's primed uh, to, uh, to mediate downstream phosphorylation events. So Alex then asked the question, could I tune CAR T cell signaling by making mutations in the CD28 domain? So perhaps reduce the intensity of the signaling uh, by either lowering CD3 zeta phosphorylation uh, or altering LCK. So he first made mutations in tyrosines. Uh, they're known to confer uh, signaling from CD28. Uh, you can mutate these tyrosines to phenylalanines, and indeed you still have very functional CARs. They make interferon gamma, IL-2, and TNF, uh, very similar to the wild-type 28 zeta receptor and indeed continued to make more cytokine than you would see with a 41BB receptor. But if you look at the western blot on, on, on the right, the only, and you go down uh, to the fourth or fifth panel and look at CAR CD3 zeta phosphorylation, you only affect the basal phosphorylation with the Y3 mutation when you mutate all three of the tyrosines. Uh, but that still was insufficient to uh, reduce the uh, rapidity of the signaling, for example, if you look at PLC gamma 1 and SLIP76 phosphorylation. So Alex then made an additional mutation in the LCK binding site of CD28. Uh, this is a P to A mutation. Uh, and now when you make this mutation in conjunction with the tyrosine mutations, now what you essentially are able to do is reduce both basal CD3 phosphorylation and also now make uh, signaling of downstream intermediates like PLC gamma 1, for example, look much more like you would see with the 41 BB receptor. So essentially by making mutations that tune the signaling strength, you can actually derive CAR T cells uh, that are uh, still functional and indeed uh, more ef uh, effective uh, than the wild type counterpart. Uh, now, this has uh, subsequently um, been shown uh, to, to occur with uh, alternative mutations that tune signaling in CD28 zeta cars. This is a really nice paper by Michelle Satellane's group, uh, where instead of mutating the CD28 domain, what they mutated was the ITAM uh, tyrosines in the CD3 zeta chain. And what Michelle found was that by making these mutations to dampen signaling, he could actually improve the activity uh, in vivo, much like we've seen with the CD28 mutations of the CD28 zeta cars, and indeed, again, transcriptionally uh, uh, engineer cells that uh, had greater memory potential. So in summary, what I, I tried to show you today was that as we design these synthetic molecules, whether they be chimeric receptors or other receptors uh, that we introduce into cells to confer functions, we can't always uh, uh, assume that they're going to work um, when expressed in cells in different modular forms that don't exist in nature. I think we have to uh, really begin to evaluate uh, in a more rigorous way how these molecules actually direct cell fate and function uh, using uh, more sophisticated approaches and assays uh, that can interrogate what the receptors are doing. I think what we've shown you is that we can, with chimeric receptors, the current uh, available receptors, we can uh, identify uh, improved next-generation design 
designs, one might ask the question, could you improve 41BB CD3 Zeta cars? And indeed, we have uh, now designs that are based on additional mass spec uh, analysis of car versus TCR signaling that we think improves the sensitivity of those receptors. Uh, so I think uh, I'll stop there and just want to acknowledge uh, the people, uh, particularly Alex Salter in the lab, who uh, this is really uh, all of his work uh, in collaboration with the Polovich Lab Laboratory and our Translational Data Sciences Group. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Rydell. Um, we're going to move uh, right along to our second speaker today, and that's Dr. Wendell Lim. Uh, Dr. Lim is the Byers Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at the University of California, San Francisco, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. His research focuses on the design principles of molecular circuits that govern cell decision-making and responses. His laboratory has made contributions to understanding, understanding the molecular machinery of cell signaling and how molecular modules have been used in evolution to build novel new behaviors. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Dr. Lim. Thank you, Sean. It's really a pleasure to be here and to participate in this webinar with uh, Stan. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, take a little step back and try to ask, you know, what are some of the uh, big problems that we face uh, looking forward uh, in trying to make uh, CAR T cells a robust and reliable and safe uh, therapy for, for cancer, especially for broader cancers, including uh, solid tumors. Um, what are the critical problems that we have to solve and what are the critical building blocks that we need in order to solve these problems? So I'll talk a little bit about that and I'll particularly uh, try to tell you some stories about our efforts to uh, improve the way that CAR T cells uh, recognize uh, tumors and discriminate against normal normal tissues. Um, so uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, and as was described by uh, Stan, um, CAR T's are essentially, uh, CAR receptors are essentially a synthetic receptor that we put into uh, T cells. And m quite miraculously, this allows us uh, to then retarget the, the uh, T cells to recognize uh, cells in the body uh, that have this, uh, this uh, target antigen and then to kill them. And this has turned out to be remarkably effective in treating uh, certain B cell cancers by targeting the CD19 uh, antigen. So um, this has led to you know, our current state where we have two FDA-approved cell therapies, uh, both of which target B cell mal malignancies by uh, recognizing CD19. Um, so uh, the, uh, the advent of these approved therapies is really quite uh, miraculous, and uh, I think uh, we're all here because of the amazing response rates that we see uh, in treating uh, these cancers with these products. Uh, at the same time, however, um, there are a lot of issues that, that uh, we face. We realize that these, these therapies are very expensive, uh, and how we deliver them and their accessibility is an issue. But then also, um, there are, even with these products, but, but certainly with many of the things that are in clinical trials, uh, many toxic uh, adverse effects, and in some, some cases, uh, many cases, a lot of the solid tumor trials have, been, have shown uh, uh, poor uh, efficacy. Um, so like many uh, uh, new technologies, uh, I think the CAR T-cell field uh, is uh, behaving along the lines of the so-called Gardner hype cycle, which is shown on the slide here. The idea is that uh, in any kind of technology that's exciting and new, uh, there are often big technology trigger advances that lead to uh, um, the so-called peak of inflated expectations. Um, and then as you hit problems, you can hit the so-called trough of disillusionment, and it takes time to get to the steady state of what uh, you know, a productive field uh, or technology is. And so I think it's in instructive to think about where we are with respect to cell therapies, CAR T therapies, where are we in this hype cycle? We certainly have hit um, an area where there are a lot of um, uh, inflated expectations, and we're just learning um, at the very beginning how to deal with this. So I think in the long run, what we'd like to be able to do is to look forward more and ask how do we minimize the time in this trough of dis disillusionment? Um, so uh, uh, one reflection of where we are is you know, the question of uh, would you or would you advise a family member to take uh, a cell therapy like a CAR-T therapy or an experimental one? And I think that that's a great question. Uh, it's um, kind of like, uh, by analogy, thinking about 
um, uh, flight, which is that um, you know early in the days of the Wright brothers, they showed that you we could fly. But would you get on this plane? And 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 the question I think for uh, uh, CAR T cells is how do we actually get to a state uh, like on the right where um, we have kind of a commercial uh, airplane uh, flight business. Um, and platform that is uh, very safe and that we really don't think twice about uh, in terms of getting on a plane. So how do we move uh, cell therapy to that kind of state? Is it possible? What are the problems that we have to solve? Um, so in terms of trying to move this whole ecosystem forward, there are obviously a lot of different pieces here. There are pieces that are actually outside of how we engineer the cells specifically in their behavior, how we manufacture them, how we manage the cost, the availability. These are all huge factors that will um, play into uh, how much we can apply these kinds of therapies um, to diseases. Um, what I want to focus more on today is the issue of what we need to make the cells do specifically. Uh, what do we need to do in terms of the cell engineering to make them better uh, therapeutically so that they can, for example, start effectively treating the broader range of solid tumors? How do we make them more effective? How do we make them safe and reliable? So uh, this slide uh, just shows um, sort of five aspects that, that I think are really important to address in terms of improving uh, anti-cancer T cell therapies. Um, the, the overall point here is that for solid cancers, um, there are multiple problems that need to be solved. Uh, so there's no simple fix. So uh, on this diagram, for example, um, we really need to improve in red the recognition, the ability of the T cells to recognize the tumor and discriminate against normal tissues. Uh, in many cases now with solid cancers, we have targeted um, uh, tumor-associated antigens or overexpressed antigens like HER2, for example, but um, the, these uh, antigens are also, over, are also expressed at lower levels in normal tissues, and this can lead to cross-reaction uh, and toxic uh, side effects. Uh, there are other issues. We have to try to get the cells, uh, traffic them uh, in orange, uh, to the tumors. In many cases, we don't get good uh, cells going to the, to the tumors. Uh, in yellow, we also have to increase their proliferation and persistence. It's very important, as Stan mentioned, to have cells that, that um, survive and, and have a durable response. And then in addition, in purple, um, in solid cancers, of course, many tumors have um, uh, 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 immunosuppressive microenvironments that can um, suppress or um, dampen uh, immune responses. And of course, these come in many different flavors. There are many ways to have uh, a suppressive response. So we have to figure out ways to uh, overcome this, either by making the cells resistant to this or helping the cells actively remodel those kinds of microenvironments. And then finally, in green, um, we need to have better control of these cells, that uh, we want to put in a lot of autonomous um, recognition and decision-making behaviors into the T cells, but ultimately, we really it's very important to be able to have um, the physician be able to control or override these uh, in terms of having gas or breaks or suicide switches and things like that. Um, so uh, these are all, I think, critical uh, features. And if you think about uh, the um, that the the evolution of uh, um, of CAR T cells, that uh, with um, the first generation uh, CAR T cells, uh, you know, uh, which did not have co-stimulation, uh, relied on recognition by the SCFVs, but really a big breakthrough was the addition of um, co-stimulatory motifs to get ge second generation CARs that would increase the proliferation and persistence to address uh, that aspect. Um, but I think there's a lot that we um, need to do and improve in terms of uh, improving all five of these aspects and trying to find uh, modular solutions for these problems and then how we can um, uh, put them together to, to uh, come up with solutions that fit the particular uh, needs of, of each cancer that we're trying to address. Okay, uh, I think I, I, I went ahead and mentioned this before that again, early uh, uh, CAR designs only focused on the recognition, did not work very well in terms of uh, in vivo uh, persistence and, and, and efficacy, but then second generation CARs that added the co-stimulatory motifs, added proliferation, and now made the products that are effective today. Um, and in addition, um, the, uh, I want to also point out that in terms of recognition, uh, CD19 is effective um, but uh, but it is far from perfect in recognition because it also targets 
um, both the cancer and normal B cells, so you get B cell aplasia. It just happens to be that uh, uh, killing of this compartment is actually tolerable. So um, that's part of why the CD19 has been uh, sort of a perfect first case uh, and an approved product. Um, but uh, when we face things like solid cancers, we really uh, need to uh, come up with better recognition. Okay, so um, in solid cancers, in uh, some cases, CAR T cells are therapeutically ineffective, so we need to actually make them more powerful uh, and uh, more effective. Uh, in, but in other cases, CAR Ts show lethal or toxic normal organ cross-reaction. Um, so really, there are a set of things that we have to solve. In potency, we want to increase proliferation and persistence, increase their resistance to the suppressive microenvironment or their ability to somehow remodel or overcome that, increase their trafficking to the tumors, um, and then uh, on the other side, we have to balance that with improving recognition uh, and discrimination of the tumors, uh, as well as having uh, ways to control these cells. Um, so it's this two-sided challenge because as we increase the potency of these cells, if we make them and people are making mutations either to the cars or intrinsically to the T cells to try to make them stronger or more uh, durable, but if, as we increase their potency, um, we need to coordinately increase their precision, uh, their recognition, because otherwise we could get uh, more uh, toxic uh, uh, adverse effects. So we want to try to solve these individual challenges that I've outlined and then figure out how to put them together as composite solutions. Okay, so uh, I think this is uh, one of the reasons that we're very excited about cell therapies is that uh, if you compare cell therapies to more traditional platforms like small molecules or biologics, what is unique about um, cells is that they are these living beings that have sensing uh, molecules and in internal circuits that make decisions and allow them to move around and, and, and execute complex uh, actions. They're really, we view them as kind of a programmable robot. And in fact, as we talk about the different problems that we have to solve and the ways of integrating them, um, you can see how really you, you could only do that with um, a programmable kind of uh, more complex device like a living cell. Uh, and, and it would be difficult to achieve the kind of balances uh, that uh, functions and, and balances between different functions that, uh, with uh, uh, purely a molecular therapy. Um, so um, this slide shows, shows some of the sort of modular uh, behaviors that we've been trying to work on. Uh, one is to uh, come up with uh, ways to uh, have a physician have user remote control over cells, and this is, involves um, uh, using small molecules that can control, uh, turn on and off the, uh, the CAR-T behavior. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, one thing that I will focus on a lot is giving these cells new sensors that allow them to recognize more molecules and more um, elements in their environment uh, so that they can make smarter decisions. Uh, and in particular, we want to be able to take these new sensors and link them together into more intelligent decision-making circuits that allow us to, to uh, engineer cells that have more precise tumor recognition. And then, uh, in addition, we're also working on trying to give T cells more weapons and more capabilities to do things like be able to remodel uh, a targeted uh, solid tumor microenvironment that's suppressive. I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, but instead I'm going to really just focus on this issue of uh, increasing tumor recognition uh, precision. Okay, so um, just to rephrase some of the problems uh, that we face in solid cancers, um, that um, you, we can certainly identify uh, a number of antigens that are highly overexpressed and tied to, as drivers to cancer uh, that we could try to recognize, for example, like HER2 um, in certain solid cancers. Uh, but the problem is that if we make a T CAR T cell like this one here that targets that, it turns out that there are um, many of these uh, types of molecules like HER2 are also expressed in many normal uh, uh, tissues, epithelial tissues, uh, perhaps at lower levels, but um, because the CAR-Ts are so potent, they can cross-react and you can have lethal uh, uh, adverse effects. Um, so we want to try to improve uh, recognition, uh, and we need more selective but also flexible ways of recognizing cancers. 
Um, and so, you know, we are very good at complex recognition in a lot of other technological fields, for example, in face recognition, where uh, taking really a relatively few number of points and then their combinatorial relationship can go a long way to giving us um, incredible uh, recognition capabilities and discrimination. And what uh, we'd like to try to do is to, rather than have a car T-cell that really just focuses on one single element, can we actually design CAR T-cells such that they uh, harness and recognize multi-antigen information, can, can take a, a more complete profile and picture of a tumor or, and whether they should attack it? Uh, so uh, as an example, let's, let me give you a simple example here, which is let's say that we have this tumor here that has these purple and green antigens on their surface. Uh, these could potentially be targeted by individual CAR T cells shown at the top, um, but if you did that with either the green or the, the purple molecules, they might also cross-react with normal tissues that express either the purple or the, normal, uh, or the green um, uh, antigen. But if, for example, this particular combination of the green and purple antigens was only observed in the tumor and not in any other normal tissues, so it's a, com a unique combinatorial signature, then if we could design a T cell that actually uh, functioned in a combinatorial way to execute Boolean recognition, that is, it required both A and B to launch a killing response, then we could actually start moving up and making more complex, more sophisticated, and more specific recognition circuits. And this is just one of the simplest forms that we could, in principle, make uh, more sophisticated circuits than this, too. So the basic idea is that, uh, and is to really think about how how nature, uh, you know, and, and cells uh, in general look at things. They usually integrate lots of different signals. That's uh, what what T cells and other cells do. And um, so we'd like to be able to engineer in different sensors into. Uh, um, CAR T's, uh, ones that recognize multiple antigens that might be associated with cancer, as well as things like antigen density or markers that in the stroma, other things that, that, that are unique signatures or could be unique signatures of the tumor versus normal things. So we'd like to have modular sensors, and, and then equally importantly is we want to be able to uh, uh, integrate these, this information to, so that we can recognize the antigen profile and then have that trigger things like killing or proliferation, et cetera. So the question is, how do we actually make more sensors beyond the car that we can put into the cell? And then how do we flexibly integrate them? So I want to introduce um, uh, a new technology. We wanted to, to th look at the outside of the cell and ask, could we put other sensors beyond cars uh, that could be used to recognize these other signals in the outside environment? So... Um, I want to now describe a new platform that we developed um, for cell-cell recognition. It's another kind of receptor called a synthetic notch or syn notch receptor that we can use in conjunction with CARS uh, to mediate different flavors and different types of recognition events. And this is work that was done by uh, two outstanding postdocs, Leo Morsud and Cole Roybal. Uh, so um, this is derived uh, from the natural NOSH receptor, which is used in a lot of juxtacrine signaling in development. And in this case, NOSH binds to delta, which is this ligand on a neighboring cell. That leads to a mechanical pulling that leads to an, a cleavage uh, in the transmembrane region, releasing the intracellular part of NOSH, which can go into the nucleus and then regulate gene expression of certain targets. What we showed is that we could actually replace the outside part of NOTCH uh, completely with an SCFE, a, a novel recognition domain that recognizes target molecule X. We could also put in purple a synthetic transcription factor, uh, and now this it would be recognition would cleave it, allow that transcription factor of the nucleus, and to drive whatever genes we want to drive off a responsive promoter. So we can now engineer cells to recognize molecule X in the outside and then drive the expression of molecule Y on the inside. Uh, we can, uh, we've shown that we can put many different kinds of recognition heads on the outside of this, as well as different kinds of transcription factors on the inside. So we can actually make different flavors of SYNNOTCH that are orthogonal, that is, they don't cross-react with one another um, because they don't have things like signaling intermediates. Uh, each one will have a unique sort of response. So we can actually make a cell sense multiple things and then convert that to a gene expression change. So the reason that this is so flexible, of course, is because gene expression is a very uh, sort of, it, we know how to connect uh, promoters and things like that together in different kinds of circuits. And so how can we actually use a SYNOSH receptor in a car to start building things that integrate signals? And this is shown here. Um, and the idea is to actually use these receptors in a circuit that has sequential priming and killing uh, uh, steps and really 
the specificity here comes from the fact that uh, we're going to make the cell move through a series of states, and each of those transitions requires uh, a different signal. So, so to get it to move through those states, become active, uh, it needs to have both of those signals. So what's shown here is um, a, a new kind of cell, and this is a cell where we have a CAR gene that's going to recognize antigen B. But this is not a constitutively expressed promoter. Rather, it's driven from a promoter that uh, is uh, responsive to a synnosh receptor shown in green now to antigen a. So this cell is what we'll call unarmed because it does not express an active CAR. So if it were to encounter, say, a cell that expresses antigen B, even though that's what it would normally kill on, since it's unarmed and unprimed, it would not react. No response. Uh, if, however, it encountered a cell with antigen A, the synnosh or priming antigen, this would actually induce the expression of the CAR, but if there's no B, there's going to be no response either. Uh, the only time that you would actually see a response is if you encountered a cell that expressed antigen A. This would now prime the cell to express the CAR, and then that could recognize antigen B. So this would be a cell that is both armed uh, and activated. And so Cole uh, went on and made this kind of cell, showed that it worked very well in vitro, but we wanted to see actually would it be able to discriminate sort of single and dual antigen uh, uh, cells um, uh, in vivo. And so uh, this uh, animation just shows the um, uh, um, problem that, that we have been focusing on, that you can have a cancer that overexpresses an antigen and design a CAR T cell that recognizes that single antigen. But if it's, uh, that antigen is also expressed in bystander organs, at, even at low levels, that could lead to toxic uh, cross-reaction. Uh, in this case, what we're trying to do is saying, let's find uh, a combination that's unique. And in this case, this T cell would go into a cancer, recognize a priming antigen, and that priming antigen would transiently and locally induce the expression of a CAR T for that second red antigen and lead to killing. If this cell were to go into that bystander tissue that has the killing antigen, but it lacks the priming antigen, then this would be uh, neutral because it wouldn't be primed. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And so um, we, uh, uh, if I can advance this, let's see. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we made these cells and then put them into a mouse model uh, where we had two tumors, bilateral tumors, one that was a tumor model with the two priming and, antigen and killing antigens, and then one bystander that's a model for normal tissues that only had the uh, killing antigen. The hope was that these cells would go in, move through, and when they hit the, the bystander model, uh, because there was no priming signal, they would not get activated. But when they went into the tumor with the priming signal, they would get transiently activated and be able to kill. Okay. So uh, we are, of course, worried about two things. One, on one side, whether or not this transient activation of the cars, the transient expression, would be strong enough to be able to allow for clearance of the tumor. But then secondly, if it in fact did prime and prime strongly, uh, we also worried about whether these uh, prime cells there, th would exist in their prime state for long enough that they could actually migrate out and go back to the other tumor and show cross-reaction. Okay, so uh, Cole did this experiment and uh, in, in many mice, and uh, what we showed is, first of all, um, a big part of getting a response is uh, uh, proliferation of the T cells. So we actually saw selective proliferation of the T cells only where the dual on the dual antigen side. But then uh, even more strikingly, that as we followed these mice, that um, on one side we would see that the single antigen tumor, um, the bystander model, uh, grew and grew as if there were no T cells added. But in the very same animals, what we saw is very effective clearance of the dual antigen tumor. So in fact, these T cells that we engineered are able to recognize where they are based on the priming antigen and have very, very different effects on killing of the, based on the killing antigen. And uh, this is a picture actually of some of the mice from those experiments. What's shown on the left is a mouse that has the two tumors uh, and we don't add T cells and the tumors grow. If we added normal CAR T cells for the killing antigen, both of these would be cleared. But on the right side, you see these smarter T cells, these next generation T cells that we engineered, uh, where on the left is the, 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 single, the killing antigen only, and on the right is the one that has the priming and the killing. You can see that the, uh, the, the, the bystander model has grown as if there were no T cells added, but in that very same animal on the other side, the T cells have completely cleared the other side. Uh, so these T cells really can, can start integrating uh, multiple pieces of information and recognize, based on that, where they are and make very differential 
potential uh, quite, quite amazingly uh, discriminatory uh, decisions about killing. And so we're very excited about this uh, uh, because um, we uh, now, you know, of course, in, in this era of bioinformatics, have a lot of uh, information about tumors. And what we think is a really exciting strategy is to uh, mine this information uh, and then try to identify what are some of the signatures that could be most discriminatory of tumors versus normal tissues, uh, as well as what are the different vulnerabilities of tumors. And then if we have the right synthetic biology tools can we, and circuits, can we start building T-cells that actually are optimized to recognize this behavior? So in other words, rather than using bioinformatics and precision medicine largely to stratify patients and think about what their prognosis is, can we actually use it in a much more actionable way as, as guides to how we should design um, uh, better uh, T-cells. And we have, in fact, started doing this sort of thing and have identified a large number of antigen combinations that are predicted to yield much higher uh, tumor discrimination. Um, so, uh, you know, to conclude, I think uh, that um, other platforms for therapies, be it small molecules or uh, biologics really have developed kind of very foundational fields like synthetic chemistry and protein engineering that allow us to understand how to solve different sorts of problems that these uh, platforms have to face and come up with uh, uh, strategies uh, for, for developing effective biologics for different kinds of targets. And I think we're in the ver very early days of uh, cell therapies um, and that um, you know, the development of, of systems and synthetic biology tools and frameworks uh, will hopefully allow us to, to um, become much more facile at, at engineering uh, cells with more sophisticated, nuanced, and precise behaviors that lead to both effective and safe uh, therapies. Uh, and so to conclude, um, uh, therapeutic immune cells that precisely and safely treat solid cancers will require solving multiple challenges simultaneously, things like potency, specificity, and control. Uh, the uh, we are uh, and others are trying to develop kind of modular systems that address each of these problems uh, and allow us to program cellular behavior that uh, could be uh, have show combinatorial functions that give us the best options uh, in the long run. Uh, this includes things like smarter tumor recognition, uh, targeted something I didn't talk about, targeted delivery or remodeling of tumor microenvironments and then other mechanisms for increasing the potency and persistence, whether it's things like making better CAR sequences or making changes uh, to the, the T cells intrinsically to give them better, better properties, and then, of course, things like uh, engineering, uh, trafficking, and targeting of tumors. Uh, I talked specifically about smart recognition profiles, how we can engineer uh, cells to, to recognize multi-antigen multi signatures, and we have found in preliminary bioinformatic analysis that there are many combinations of two to three antigens that seem to yield significantly improved tumor discrimination, so we're optimistic about uh, that. Uh, we're optimistic overall because, again, there are opportunities for more sophisticated recognition, and then also because nature has evolved so many cellular platforms that execute these kinds of robust, complex functions. What we really need to do is understand and unlock the, the, the ways that nature solves these problems and try to mimic and harness them uh, for our therapeutic needs. Um, and in the long run, uh, I think um, we're trying to move towards developing a robust and foundational field of cellular engineering uh, that will allow us to, to, um, uh, um, to give us new capabilities to at attack these problems in solid cancers as well as other types of uh, diseases that could be treated with cell therapy. Uh, and that uh, I think it's really important to, uh, we're going to need multiple kinds of solutions to make cells that solve the problem. So we need to, to be careful about siloing the individual technologies so we can actually bring them together to bring them to bear on the problems that we are facing. Uh, and so with that, let me thank uh, the people who did the work. I really want to particularly point out Cole Roybal, uh, who's now a professor at UCSF, and Leonardo Morsud, who is a uh, professor at USC. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lim uh, and uh, Dr. Rydell for the, the really and in, truly informative presentations that uh, you've given today. Um, we uh, now have a chance to move on to some of the questions submitted by our online viewers. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you're watching us live, you can still submit your questions by clicking the Ask a Question tab to your right, uh, typing the question into the message box, and then clicking OK. 
so the first couple of questions uh, I'm, I'm going to put to you, Dr. Rydell, uh, one is specific and one's more general. So the specific question is, um, could third-generation CD28 plus 41BB chimeric uh, antigen receptor T-cells overcome the weakness, uh, weaknesses of second-generation CAR T-cells? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, it's interesting that um, although the third generation cars were described some time ago, that um, it's not yet been clear whether or not uh, they have any superior activities. And indeed, in most of the preclinical experiments that people have done, uh, third generation cars tend to um, not function as well as as either second generation car, and I I think the challenge there is it's it, it's not just putting the molecule into the construct, it's getting it into the construct in a in a way that it would function uh, as you might anticipate, and I think with as you keep adding modules, um, again it's you know we add them under the assumption that they're going to give us a function, uh, but we really have to test that uh, much more rigorously, I think. Um, and I think, uh, just having said that, I think one of the deficiencies that we that we have in the field is that we tend to rely on in vitro assays of T-cell function uh, or in vivo models, uh, often in immunodeficient mice, um, where the rigor with which um, the endpoints that we're looking at uh, may not be sufficient to really predict how that cell will behave uh, in patients. So I think third generation cars are a good idea, um, but I think uh, so far it, I wouldn't say the data has uh, suggested that they're going to be a major step forward. And uh, to the, the more general question, um, the view asks whether there are any other mechanisms, apart from the, the ones that you're looking at, uh, any other tuning mechanisms that you're considering uh, in order to tune uh, your CAR T cells? Oh, yes, uh, for sure. Um, I think what, what we haven't um, yet published is, a, is an additional data set um, looking at uh, receptor signaling um, that has given us some real insights into um, additional uh, molecules that you might not have anticipated um, uh, would um, be used uh, in, in car design, but that uh, when they are put into cars, uh, dramatically augment uh, their sensitivity. So I think um, the answer is yes. And, 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 you know, the one wonderful thing about synthetic biology, and I think Wendell would agree, is that you know, it, it's really up to your imagination to to um, think about uh, the kinds of things that you could do to potentially augment function, and and I think what we need is again, I, I think we just need good assays and and, and methodologies for testing whether our assumptions uh, uh, are actually borne out by the data. Um, but I think it, it, there there is no question. I think that we will find uh, more sensitive cars uh, based on tuning signaling. That actually uh, segues nicely into the, the first question I had for Dr. Lim, and that is, uh, what do we need to understand in order for systems and synthetic engineering to mature as a field? Uh, you said in one of your closing slides that it, it's still early days. So what what are we missing? Well, that's a that's a broad and general question. Um, I think that uh, you know the the the, the field of, of systems biology has been trying to sort of understand what are the general patterns of, of you know, how particular uh, um, classes of, 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 of sensing and, and response circuits function. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for us, a lot of it is trying to think about what, see, look, look across biology for inspiration, um, try to understand, you know, are there sort of canonical solutions? Is there sort of a periodic table of commonly used circuits uh, and can we start trying to tap into those? Uh, so I think, you know, I mean, that's one of the other interesting things here is that um, this this field uh, with the CAR-Ts is, you know, constrains us to ask how do we solve certain kinds of problems, but as we try to come up with those solutions, I think it also forces us to think about how, um, uh, you know, natural systems work and to try to understand them uh, in a more rigorous way. And let me stay with you, Dr. Lim, a couple more specific questions. Uh, the first is, have you tried mixing um, cells expressing antigen A and cells expressing antigen B at different ratios um, and use this mixed suspension to introduce it um, into the tumor to see if there is regression? 
Yes, so that's a great question, and we have done that kind of work. So, um, what, uh, so what we've shown in vivo is that, um, uh, well, both in vivo and in vitro. So, is is that if we mix cells that ha express antigen A and antigen B on separate cells, okay, but they're together spatially, that is, the priming antigen on one cell and the and the uh, killing antigen on another, that um, we actually can see priming and then killing of those cells, so, so what we call uh, 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 trans-killing, okay? Um, so uh, that, uh, but if we, um, but what we've shown is that if they are not directly adjacent to each other, we don't see that kind of um, uh, trans-priming um, and killing, okay? So if, and part of that is that if, if we know that if, if a CAR T cell leaves an environment that has a priming uh, signal and, and now no longer has a priming signal, within a few hours, the, the CAR expression will go down and the T cell will not be uh, active. So it really doesn't have the capability to have a sustained response uh, in any other kind of tissue that lacks the priming signal, okay? But um, what's interesting, so, so the fact that we can, if they're spatially adjacent, see that kind of trans killing is actually uh, presents an opportunity. Um, a couple things. One, it, it indicates that um, you don't necessarily need to have 100% of priming antigen there, so, so heterogeneity or escape is less of a problem in recognition. And the second thing is that, as I mentioned, um, we have found that in cases of tumors that have heterogeneous antigen expression, which is often the case, that um, we can prime off certain antigens and then kill based on another one and help to um, overcome those issues with uh, heterogeneity. In other words, because they can integrate over multiple cells in the tumor, these cells can make kind of a more uh, global decision about whether to, to, to go into the killing state. And another quick question for you. Um, uh, have the new modular uh, CAR notch cell therapies shown lower neurotoxicities? Um, I'm guessing these are just in animal models at the moment uh, than uh, the, the first or second generation CAR therapies. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, a great... We uh, haven't, so if you're talking, so for example, let's say that um, with some of the CD19 um, uh, products, you do see um, uh, some uh, cerebral edema and, and neurotoxicity. Uh, and so in that case, um, we actually are trying to, to develop a, a more controlled uh, Sinach car that could address that. And, and we, we do think that it uh, may have some, some advantages. Uh, I would say also there are other kinds of cases that have shown neurotoxicity, for example, uh, uh, MAJ3 TCR um, for melanoma um, showed cross-reaction with um, related antigens in the brain, uh, other cases like that. And uh, we do think that uh, those are things that can be addressed with combinatorial recognition, either positive recognition where you have AND gate of you know, two things that might be in the tumor, uh, uh, another, say, melanoma um, antigen, or um, actually even through uh, not gates where you actually um, uh, turn off the T cell or give it negative instructions uh, when it recognizes something that, for example, is in the brain. Great. So we only have a couple more minutes left, but I'd like to squeeze in one more question. Uh, this is actually to both of you. I'll start with you, Dr. Rydell, and uh, a two-part question. Um, the first first part is, how are patients selected for CAR-T therapy? Um, are there any specific criteria that are used? And uh, the second part is that th these CAR-T therapies are heavily personalized at the moment, making them very expensive. Um, so do you think there's any chance of an off-the-shelf solution in the future? So uh, that's a good question. I think it really, you know, cuts to the heart of, of clinical translation of these new tech technologies. So currently, um, you know, there are selection criteria. They do differ somewhat um, between different trials. But for the most part, we're taking patients that have relapsed refractory disease that uh, don't have a, any other therapeutic options. So in the acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, example, um, you know, most of these patients have uh, failed chemotherapy and either are ineligible or have already failed an allogeneic transplant. And in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, it's typically patients that either are refractory to chemotherapy up front and couldn't get an autologous transplant or have failed an autologous transplant. So I think in part it's what makes the data uh, all the more encouraging is that we are treating patients at, at the very 
uh, at the very end where they have no other treatment options. In, in terms of, you know, it is personalized. It does require obtaining cells from the patient, engineering them, uh, and, and reinfusing them. Uh, th that is, uh, at the moment, I think, um, you know, something that we have to do. Um, I would say that the technologies for manufacturing cells are improving quite dramatically. Um, I think you're going to see some real innovations in that space that's going to allow us to make products uh, much more quickly. Uh, so that uh, that's an important variable. If you can make them faster, you can reduce cost. I think we can also make better cells, um, and that will reduce dose and again reduce cost. Uh, now, in terms of off-the-shelf therapies, you know, if they're, if they're allogeneic cells, you have a, a, an immunologic barrier that you have to overcome. Many groups are working on that. I think it's a fantastic area of research. Um, I think it's it's not quite there yet for the the kinds of uh, applications that we can do with autologous cells, but I think we will see uh, more of that emerging in the future. And Dr. Lim? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think that um, it's, a, it's a big problem, but, um, you know, we haven't been working on it uh, so long, and I think that uh, there is great progress being made in uh, trying to uh, solve the allergen A problem. That could be a great solution, but I think that just in ba in the basic you know manufacturing and transfection and, and delivery to uh, autologous cells, I, I I expect that we will see kind of a Moore's laws growth in the what kind of payloads we can deliver and the cost efficiency of those sorts of things. Fantastic. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time for this webinar, so uh, it just remains for me to thank today's speakers very much for being with us, uh, Dr. Stanley Rydell from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Dr. Wendell Lim from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, please go to the URL that is now up in your slide viewer to learn more about resources related to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from Science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This webinar will be made available available to view again as an on-demand presentation within about 48 hours from now. Uh, we'd like, and if you'd like to receive uh, alerts about future webinars, uh, you can just go to the sign-up link in the resources tab to, to the right um, of your slide window. Uh, we'd love to know what you thought of today's webinar. Feel free to send us an email at the address that's now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Again, thank you so much to our panel and to Cell Signaling Technology for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye.